Let us pray. <clears throat> Almighty God, we thank you now for your holy word. We thank you for the gospel of Christ. We thank you for the very words of our Savior that we're able to read here in this passage. And we ask, O oh God, that what is being taught here would sink deep down into our hearts this morning as we meditate upon the new birth, as we meditate upon the Holy Spirit who brings this new birth. We thank you for how you've worked in our lives up until this point, and we pray even this morning, during this time of preaching, that you would also work. Pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I imagine this to be kind of a secret conversation that's going on between Jesus and Nicodemus. At least in my mind when I'm thinking through this in my mind as I'm reading this passage. I'm thinking that is somewhat of a quiet conversation. But if there's any spiritual life in you, this conversation is one which is very loud and thunders to the depths of your soul. Except a man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Now hearing this is one thing, but understanding it is another. Now if I were to go from house to house asking people what Jesus means by being born again, and I'd venture to say I would receive many different definitions. Now one might say, yes, I'm born again because I was baptized. Another may say, yes, I'm born again because I speak in tongues. Someone else might say, well, I know that I'm born again because I prayed the sinner's prayer. Another might say, well, yes, of course I know I'm born again because, you know, I, I try to be a good person. I, I seek to live a good life. And then somebody else might say, well, really, we can't really know who's born again. God only knows. But none of these answers are solid things to stand on. And none of these answers would be giving good evidence that the person that you're talking to understood this conversation that we read about between Jesus and Nicodemus. So the necessity of being born again is addressed here. But our Lord also addresses the nature of the new birth, which is really what I'd like to point to your attention today. And the first thing we must consider is that this new birth is a spiritual matter. This is not something that merely involves intellectual assent. It's something that is a result of the active work of the Spirit of God. And some translations, English translations of the Bible, take us to another angle of what it means to be born again. They'll use the phrase, born from above. This second birth, which is required to enter the kingdom of God, is one which comes from above. It is a result of the active, living, working Spirit of God. And Jesus tells us in this passage about the way in which the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, works to bring life to the souls of men. He says, the wind blows where it wishes. And you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. So, what's being taught here that's important for us to know? Well, the Holy Spirit works when and how He pleases. The wind blows where it wishes. Jesus immediately points to something in nature, as He oftentimes does. and He, he, he does this to show us a spiritual truth. And... This is a truth that the writers of the Westminster Confession of Faith, for example, would have understood as well. And in a chapter 10 of the Confession, they write in section 3, this. Elect infants dying in infancy are regenerated. 
and saved by Christ through the Spirit, who worketh when and where and how he pleaseth. Now, it's not my desire this morning to focus on the subject of infants dying in infancy, but I, I, I want to examine the language they use about the way in which the Holy Spirit works. They said the Spirit works when and where and how He pleases. And I, I see that is, that's exactly what's being taught here in John chapter 3. And they said the Spirit works when, where, and how He pleases. And this is nothing but a declaration of the sovereignty of God. And a right belief in the sovereignty of God grants God the freedom to work when and where and how He pleases. You know, look at the language our Lord uses here. The wind blows where it wishes. This could be translated, the wind blows where it wills. And, you know, we have many that have tried to restrict God's freedom to work when and where and how He pleases. Uh, they've tried to say things like God is subject to the will of man. They've tried to say things like the Holy Spirit is a gentleman and gentlemen always ask for permission before they do something. But this is not what's taught in the Holy Scriptures. As we see, for instance, in the case of King Nebuchadnezzar, if you've read, ever read the book of Daniel, you'll know that... Um, God turned him over to the mind of an animal for a, a period of time. And after he returns to his right mind, uh, this is what is said there in the book of Daniel. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And God does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? This is much different than saying God must ask for permission for man to do something or be dependent on the will of man in any way in what he does. And so, in this conversation about the new birth, we see that Christ confirms that God works this way even, even in the salvation of men and women. He, he, he says the wind. This is the illustration he uses. He says it blows where it wishes. So, if the Holy Spirit wants to raise a sinner to spiritual life, he will. If he wants to pass by and leave a sinner dead in their trespasses and sins, he justly passes them by. And so we have to understand that, yes, it's necessary that we must be born again to enter the kingdom of God, but that doesn't negate that God, it's only in God's power to give this new birth. And so John writes in the first chapter of this gospel, he says this, But as many as received him, Jesus, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name, which were, not, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Jesus also says concerning the wind that you hear the sound thereof, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. You know, we, we do not know the mind of the Holy Spirit we don't know what God's plan is as He's moving about mankind, bringing life to the souls of men. But we do, according to our Lord, hear the sound of it. Though we do not know where the Holy Spirit is coming from, we know obviously that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and from the Son. We know that. But as He's moving about the earth, doing His work, we don't know exactly where He's coming from or what He's going to do next. We know... When he's working, though, because we can sense the effects which can only come from his work. If we think about the wind, it's invisible. No one can actually see the wind itself. The only way we know the wind is blowing is by the sound it makes when it whistles through the cracks or... We see the trees swaying or dust blowing around. You know, when people talk about seeing a tornado, they're not actually seeing the wind of the tornado. They're seeing all the dirt and they're seeing all the debris uh, that is sucked up into the tornado. And that makes it visible. So it's interesting that when the Holy Spirit came down on the day of Pentecost, that it says, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing, mighty wind. 
and it filled all the house where they were sitting. So it seems to me that God is trying to emphasize over and over again and, and relate uh, that the work of the Holy Spirit is like the wind. And so then, how do we know that the Holy Spirit is working in a person's life? Uh, do we know this simply by a mere profession of faith? I mean, a profession of faith is good. It's good to profess that you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that He is the Savior, that He is the one who has died on the cross to make an atonement for sin, that He is the one who has risen from the dead. It's good to make a profession of faith. It's good to believe all the articles in the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. But that's like feeling a small breeze and watching one leaf blow off a tree. Now, to make our calling and election sure, as, as Peter tells us, uh, we, we want to know that the wind is really blowing in our life. We, we, we can't see the Holy Spirit, but we can look for His effects. And so you have to ask yourself these questions. Are you repenting and confessing your sins daily? Are you living by the faith of the Son of God? Are you endeavoring to live in peace with all men and walk after holiness? Has God made a great change in your life? And is He continually making that great change in your life? Turning you from sin to obedience. Now, the, this is how we can know that the Holy Spirit is working savingly in us. This is how we know the wind is blowing. And I've said many times, many times, and I still stand by this. There's a lot of Protestant denominations out there that claim to, I guess, have a monopoly, so to speak, on the Holy Spirit. But I'm going to tell you right now that the Reformed Protestant Christian religion, rightly believed and applied, puts a greater emphasis on the role of the Holy Spirit than any other Christian tradition, even Pentecostalism. Now, one of the things that it means to be reformed is to affirm the sovereignty of God. And that's to say that the Spirit of God works when and where and how He pleases. In the book of Acts, for instance, uh, it's Pentecost Sunday, so I'm, I'm trying to relate this to Pentecost. And of course, that is when uh, we see the Holy Spirit coming down upon the, the early church. Um, in the book of Acts, we, we do not see one set formula to receive the Holy Spirit. We see the Holy Spirit working when He wants to in a variety of different ways and timing. Just when you think, as you're reading through the book of Acts, just when you think you, 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 you've got it down pat and you say, well, I need to do this, this, and this, and then I'll receive the Holy Spirit. We see God showing us that the gift of the Holy Spirit is given in His timing not ours. And so what's God trying to show us? Even in the book of Acts, you'll find that He's trying to show us that the Holy Spirit works when and where and how He pleases. The, 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 the Westminster Divines couldn't have worded that any better. This also means that God is also able to work above and without means. And what do we talk about means? Well, we typically talk about means as things that God uses to accomplish something that He wants to accomplish. Um, God typically works through means. We know that. He ordinarily works through the means of grace. So we, we call the means of grace the Word of God. Uh, prayer is a means of grace. The sacraments are a means of grace. And if one wants to be saved and also sanctified, you know, they're are, there, there to make a diligent use of the means of grace. However, we have to understand that God can work above and without means to regenerate men if He so desires, which is certainly the case for infants who die in infancy, as well as others who cannot be called by the ministry of the Word. And this is not the norm. This is not the norm. To say that God is constrained, though, to work through means 100% of the time is to say that God cannot work when where and how He pleases. And so, this is one reason why, for instance, we as Reformed uh, Christians do not embrace the doctrine of baptismal regeneration. What does that mean? Well, that means that you're actually born again. Every time the act of baptism is performed, someone is born again. We would not 
uh, affirm that because baptismal regeneration in, a, in, a, in, in one sense is saying that God must always regenerate during the act of baptism. And one of the problems with that is that it takes away God's freedom to work when and where and how He pleases. And it says also there in the Westminster Confession, chapter 5, it says, God in His ordinary providence maketh use of means, yet is free to work without, above, and against them at His pleasure. Now, if you go back to the 19th century, if you um, have studied Baptist history, uh, you will find that there was a great battle over the necessity of the means of grace, how the Holy Spirit uses the means of grace. And <clears throat> part of the Baptist church uh, believed that the gospel should go forth and missionaries should be sent out in order to keep fulfilling the Great Commission. And <clears throat> even though all, almost all the Baptists at that time were Calvinistic, uh, most still believed that God ordinarily used means, as the Westminster Divines also affirm. Uh, in other words, they believe that in order for souls to be saved, somebody had to go out and tell them about Jesus. And then you had the um, other group. Uh, they believed that God regenerates everyone's, every one of His, His elect spontaneously, without means, and uh, this early group, this early uh, group of Baptists, would split off, and there would be a split in the Baptist Church. The, you would have the Missionary Baptists or the Southern Baptists, and then uh, those who um, believed in this spontaneous regeneration that were against the means. They would they would be um, considered to be the Primitive Baptists. Maybe you've heard of Primitive Baptists as you're driving through, perhaps Virginia or West Virginia. Maybe you've seen a Primitive Baptist church. Well, that that comes from that split in the mid 19th century over the necessity of the means of grace. Do we really need to go out and evangelize, or is God going to save His elect regardless of whether we go or not? So this is this is something that split uh, the Baptist church uh, back in the 19th century. Um, Of course, you know, the, the primitive Baptists, they, they, they're holding a form of, of hyper-Calvinism there. And so, to me, that's a problem because they're not understanding that ordinarily God uses means. He uses the preaching of the gospel. He uses prayer. He uses the sacraments for us to come to faith and grow in grace. And so... That was a great problem. But I believe that we can recognize that God can work without means, if He so desires. We do have to say that it, if He wishes to do so, He can. We have to give God the freedom to do as He wishes, but we have to maintain that no one is ordinarily saved without means, because that's what's taught in the Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Tells us right there, there is a means to faith. That's the Word of God. It's the preaching of the Gospel. The Gospel message. The good news of Jesus. And the bottom line is, God saves us in His timing and using the means He ordains. It's, it's not, His salvation is not tied to any man or any institution. His salvation is worked in us by the Holy Spirit alone. But many have made the error. <clears throat> and they have said that God saves without means. The primitive Baptists, some of the old line Presbyterians, some of the old Anglican predestinarians, they all erred on the side of uh, hyper-Calvinism and they kind of just sat around and waited for regeneration to come. We must be careful not to fall into the thinking that for instance, the preaching of the gospel is not necessary for people to come to genuine faith in Christ. Babies, people who can't be called by the ministry of the Word, you know, they may be these exceptions that they are regenerated without means, but if you're sitting here in this congregation this morning, I can assure you 
um, that you have a responsibility to make a diligent use of the means of grace uh, that our Lord provides us to grow in your faith and to grow in grace. You had other controversies about this issue. Also, you had, uh, you know, the great evangelists of the First Great Awakening, George Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, uh, Samuel Davies, the great Presbyterian evangelist. Um, they faced similar issues in their ministries, and um, may, maybe perhaps you've heard that there were, cert, there were certain groups that formed during this First Great Awakening, this movement of God in early America and in England in, in the um, mid-18th century. But um, <clears throat> you had the Old Light Congregationalists and the Old Side Presbyterians, and they were mainly against the revivals of the First Great, Great Awakening. They called everyone who believed it was a genuine work of God a new light or a new side preacher because they themselves felt it was not a revival. So if you believed that the First Great Awakening was a great move of God, you were called by many in the Old Line Presbyterian Church or the Old, line, old Side Congregationalist Church, you were called a new light. You were called a new side preacher. And this split presbyteries, this split associations, it actually split the Presbyterian Church. I mean, the Presbyterian Church has split since then. But this split the Presbyterian Church from 1741 to 1758. Now, you don't, you don't have Methodist, the Methodist movement yet. The Methodist movement would come later, uh, building upon the foundation of the New Lights. But the, um, the revivals of the First Great Awakening held to a biblical view of God's sovereignty. And they saw the need to seek the Lord. They saw the need to make our calling and election sure. They saw the need to have a conversion experience. Uh, they saw the need to see the evidence of the Spirit's work in our life. And they warned people that a mere profession of faith, a, a mere belonging to a congregation, was not equated with being born again of the Spirit. So they knew how important it was to see the effects of the wind and know that it was blowing swiftly. If the Holy Spirit is working, my friends, we will know He is working by the fruit that is produced. This is something that is taught throughout the scope of Scripture. Jesus says, you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. You can't tell where it comes from or where it is going, but you do hear the sound of it. You do know that the wind is blowing by the effects. Now, after Jesus tells Nicodemus these things, he says to him, How can these things be? And we see that Jesus answers him as if he should have already known what he was talking about. He says, Are you a teacher in Israel and you do not know these things? Well, what's that tell us? Well, it tells us that this new birth of the Spirit is something taught in the Old Testament too. And God had been regenerating sinners since the fall of man in Eden. Nicodemus, a teacher in Israel, could not grasp that, even though he should have. I mean, we see even in the Old Testament the sign of circumcision, that it was pointing to the fact that something needed to happen to a person on the inside to prepare them to meet God. God told them they needed to be circumcised in heart. He told them that He was going to give them a new heart and a new spirit. But Nicodemus knew nothing of this. He said, how can these things be? Now, I believe that God was using this conversation to open up Nicodemus's eyes. He may have been a great teacher in Israel. He may have been a zealous Jew. But he was, he was, he was ignorant of the necessity of the work of the Holy Spirit in coming to know God. Jesus says that Nicodemus was not receiving the witness of the Holy Spirit. He was not receiving the witness of Christ and, and the disciples either. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen, and you receive not our witness. We, we can see that Nicodemus was interested in Jesus and that he continues to be. Um, after all, I mean, he, he had come to the Lord by night to talk to him. He said, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that you're doing except God be with him. 
but we see that he's still in need of grasping this truth about regeneration. And in reality, what that means is he needed to, to grasp the job of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus says to him, I have told you earthly things and you believe not. How shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Now it's important to note that Jesus is most likely speaking about all the Pharisees because Nicodemus kind of is coming on behalf of the Pharisees. Remember he says, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. So <clears throat> surely he's coming to get some information and he's going to take it back to his other fellow Pharisees and they're going to discuss what, what, what was talked about. And so Jesus makes this broad statement to Nicodemus and to the rest of the Pharisees, I do believe. And he says, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Well, the answer to that question, the answer to that question is that we need the Holy Spirit to impart a living faith in us. The whole conversation with Nicodemus has been mainly about the new birth and that this new birth can only come from the Holy Spirit. And when the gospel is preached, my friends, if the Holy Spirit is working in us, He improves, He makes effectual the Word of God so that we really believe it. You know, many times I, I, I feel like that uh, I reach new stages in my faith and I feel like... I'm, I'm coming to know Christ for the first time. In reality, I'm just coming to know Him in a way, deeper way than, than I ever thought I could. Because the Holy Spirit is continuing to bring, bring about true and deeper faith in me. The Holy Spirit improves. He makes effectual the Word of God so that we really believe it, that we really believe it enough to conform our lives to it, our beliefs, our worldview. It's just not enough to say, I believe. No, true faith, worked in us by the Holy Spirit, is going to motivate us to really conform our lives to the way of Christ our worldview, our beliefs. So you see, the Spirit uses the Word to make us into obedient believers in Jesus Christ, but without the Spirit, the Word makes no impact. The Word makes no impact. So you can see the message that God is trying to get across um, at Pentecost. What's that message? Well, He's trying to say the Holy Spirit is the one who gives Life to the church to obey the Word of God. In a church that's disobedient to God's Word, especially if they're disobedient concerning clear matters of the Word, we understand there are, there are uh, non-essential things that we can disagree on. But clear matters of the Word, if a church is disobedient on those matters, they're operating without the life of the Holy Spirit. And, that, and that's true with individuals as well. Many professing Christians will not accept that, but that's true. You go down to churches today that would deny fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith, and yet they'll claim the Holy Spirit is with them, that He's working, but He's not. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives life to the church to obey the Word of God. <clears throat> Going back to John 1, but as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God. That power to become the sons, sons and daughters of God is the Holy Spirit. He gives us the power. He gives us everything we need to do to obey the gospel. Desire. He gives us the desire to do it. He gives us the ability. He gives us the faith. It all comes from the Holy Spirit. And we cannot put the Holy Spirit in a box. We must say that as the third person of the Holy Trinity, that He works when, where, and how He pleases. We know that His work is absolutely necessary. And we know that His work is going to lead us to do what Jesus commands. He, and He's going to convict us when we try to do what Jesus forbids. And so, this morning, if you are believing Jesus and you're concerned about obeying Jesus, and you find that you're being empowered by God 
to believe and to obey Jesus, that's really good evidence that the wind is blowing in your life. That's really good evidence that the Holy Spirit is working. It's really good evidence that you are on your way to heaven. If you don't see profound effects of the Holy Spirit in your life, then you need to beware. Perhaps you need to start feeding upon God's Word more. Perhaps you need to make, a pra make prayer a priority in your life. Perhaps you need to spend more time in prayer confessing and repenting of your sins than asking God for things. Perhaps you need to take the Lord's Supper more seriously. Perhaps you need to get alone with God. If we feel that we lack the Holy Spirit's power in our life, we must put ourselves under the means of grace. The Word of God. We must pray. We must take seriously the sacraments. <clears throat> and if you'll put yourself under the means of grace, I do believe that you will experience the swift wind blowing in your life. Because He uses these things to try and change us drastically. And I'm thankful that we have a Lord and a God who is active in His creation. He's not... The deist God who is like the clockmaker who just you know, wound up the universe and then just steps back. and No, He is active. And His Holy Spirit is active in the church. He's active in the believers of Christ. He's active. And he, there's real power to be experienced from the Holy Spirit. Now, many have abused that. Many have misunderstood the power of the Holy Spirit, but we see that unless one is born again of the Spirit of God, he cannot see the kingdom of God and he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the Holy Spirit, that precious gift from above that you've poured out upon your church and that you continue to pour out upon your church. We thank you for the Holy Spirit's work in our, in our hearts as well. That he has made us into a believing and repenting people. A people who are concerned about obeying Christ. People who are concerned about doing your will. With the time that you have given us. And so we ask for a greater measure of the Spirit. That we may be empowered to do something for your glory in these last days. We ask, O oh God, that you would guide us into all truth through the Holy Spirit, for that is one of his jobs, that you would keep us and grant us your peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.